Mario, what's up, man? Hey, brother. Your dad. Yes. You just posted a photo. I saw it. Yeah. 89? 89, man. Wow. That crazy? 89. My dad had a play called Ain't Supposed to Die a Natural Death. And the quote is from someone that wrote uh, that a slave ain't supposed to die a natural death. They're either going to they're gonna die some other way. Melvin Van Peebles is going to, you know, die a natural death. He lived a full life. Uh, he's been on some lists. He was on the FBI list, <laughs> you know, um, as a dangerous Negro, which is a, a compliment. <laughs> uh, good trouble. That's a T-shirt right yeah, there. A T-shirt right dangerous there. dangerous Negro. Basically, right. Um, and uh, he's 89. He said, I, I still run fast. Just, you know, stuff goes by slower. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, you know uh, smart cat. Uh, he's older now, but, but one of the smartest cats that I've known. And he was the guy that, and I know I've said this to you before, that early on said some, some fathers, uh, especially black fathers, can teach you how to play ball. My dad couldn't play ball. But he said, I'll teach you how to own the team. See that that see that that's I love that because um, uh, uh, when I had season tickets to the Houston Texans, we were after the game was over, we were down underneath, and we were waiting for the players to come out and coaches and with all the family. Right. And uh, Wade Phillips, uh, son of legendary Houston Oilers head coach uh, Bum Phillips, was defensive coordinator. And so my nephew Chris, Chris probably was three four. So Chris had had a football and he was having. Chris signed his own ball. Chris thought that he put his name on it. Beautiful. Like, like, See, that, right. he's, he's thinking for what's going to happen, so, not what is happening. It was hilarious. Yeah. And so we walk over, and right. so, so Phillips goes, uh, so Chris, yeah. uh, what position you want to play? I said, no, 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 no. Chris is not being raised to play. He's been raised to own the team. Man. And wait, so, Man. Doc, he sort of like, yes. oh, oh, I said, Yes. 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 That's how he's being raised. Yes. And that that that, that is mind, so that mindset early on. Because it completely yes. yeah. it to me it completely changes the trajectory of one's career or life when they are thinking differently. They're thinking about no endorsing checks as opposed to somebody only handing you a check. Right. And that's, that's when, you're, when you mentally have gotten off the plantation. You know, when you start to say, wait a minute, if they can make money from us, we can make money from us. Uh, and that's something that when you ask about my dad, that he was, was very, he always said, son, the golden rule is he who has the gold makes the rule. Mm -hmm. Not that gold is important, but you have to understand how this is played. You know, that America is built on capitalism and democracy. Mm -hmm. So you want to vote, you want to have a say so in that but you also want to have some sort of business going that allows you to end up owning a team. When you, when you think about um, all of those different conversations um, with, with your dad and, mm -hmm. and watching him, um, how are you then making sure that your children are, are seeing the same lessons or learning these things even if you say, look, you may not want to be a director, but you can learn from what I'm doing and still apply it to whatever career you want to go into. Okay, so that's, that's a good question, Roland, and that's going, to be, that's going to vary with each soul you get. Kids don't come from us, they come through us. So each, like this interview right now, I can't tell where you're going to go with it, right? And you can't I have tell, no idea where I'm going to go with it. And you can't tell what my response will be, right? right? So it's in the live, it's a moment. Kids are like that, so you have to sort of help figure out who that human being is and help uh, them be the best version of who they can be. So for example, I'll give you an example. I have my eldest daughter, Maya. Beautiful, beautiful first daughter. Social man, she can get up like me. We can go talk to strangers, no problem. Uh, every teacher said, wow, you know, Maya, if she spent as much time on her uh, academic life as she did her social life, the girl would be an A student. I said, okay, some people would, because she's still always talking. So some people would see that as a distraction. Right. I said, okay, that's an asset. So I, I made a deal with Maya. I said, Maya, tell you what, what school you want to go to? Daddy will pay for any school you want to go to. I, I have it like that right now. I don't know how long I have it, but right now I can do that. 
But here's the deal. You, you pick that school, but if you don't get a, over a B, I'm going to pick the next school. Oh, so she wanted to go to this little girl school and Archer, a little, you know, school in Beverly Hills. I said, okay, we'll do it. You know, a little mean girls type vibe. <laughs> you know, everybody wearing designer stuff. Not my flavor. Man. Right, right. I'm not that guy. She, she talked. She had a good time. Socialized. Just got under a B minus. Didn't quite get there. So daddy picked the next school. So I picked the school in France. She didn't speak French. <laughs> that wasn't in the deal. I, I sent her to school in France. So maintenant, elle parle français, tu vois? Donc, she had to learn French. Now, now, what? she was thinking, you, yeah. were, you were thinking, not even just here in the U.S., hey, yeah, not yeah. just California, no. but right, you no. said, no, no. Oh, no, yeah, we sent her to school in France, hated it the first year, cut her hair off in protest, mouth all poked out, didn't want to talk to me, said, good, you're going back again. Still, I didn't, I didn't see the grades I was. She said, Dad, this is unfair. They're teaching me stuff in French. I don't speak French. By the second time, I know Maya loves to gossip. She got so tired of not knowing what was going on. She got her little French boyfriend, learned <laughs> French, and now fluent in French. I brought her back. She said, thank you. Now, looking back, that's the way I dealt with Maya. But I also sent her to Ghana to, Ghana to work in an orphanage. I also sent her to live with um, one of the first black uh, uh, politicians in Africa for a while to set up girls' schools. Uh, uh, so that was with Maya. Now, my son Mandela, different vibe. Mm -hmm. My other son, Michaelo, different vibe. Uh, my, my two of my kids, Michaelo and Maya, now have the house across the street from my house, right? But they out there working on the yard, you would think they're just workers. They dig in, planting, moving, painting, because that's good for them to do. So that it, each kid's going to be a little different. But what I found here, Roland, is the one thing I have found pretty consistently is um, you can't teach your kids heart but you can give them exposure and experience. Right. So send my Morgana, my daughter, to teach in Thailand. Send Mandela to teach in South Africa. So get them exposure. And exposure is right around where empathy is. And that's just around the corner from heart. And so what happens is now they experience stuff and go, wow, these people ain't got what I got. Mm -hmm. The whole world don't see what we have. Even in terms of America, we as Americans travel, but we also don't, we also don't often leave our socioeconomic group. Right. Right. So I sent my kids to military camp and in Carolina with Red, Red State. Then next year, I sent them to a yoga camp where they did Vedantic healing stuff and vegan food. And are they going to be, be, either be really diverse or schizophrenic or <laughs> just super well-rounded? But having that well-rounded thing allows you to understand different people. Here's the thing. I believe it's very hard to love people, to lead people if they don't feel the love. Mm. And if you can't understand different people, then you, you, you can't love them. We knew Malcolm loved us, whether you agreed with him or not. We knew Dr. King loved us. We knew Mother Teresa loved us. We knew Gandhi loved us. Do you know what I mean? And that, that's the difference. So I wanted my kids to have heart, be intelligent. But we don't need more smart, rich people. We, where we're going right now with this climate, brother, it's not just about racial diversity. Tomorrow's game is going to be about biodiversity. So. We need people with heart and with, with a higher consciousness. And that's what I've tried to give my kids. I'm just at the point now I'm starting to feel like I almost like my, kid, my kids. They, they, <laughs> they close. You know, I'm like going. So that's one of the things that my dad saw in me. He saw, he said, okay, I know how to deal with Mario. He's an ambitious cat. So I know what I can do with him. But that's not the same thing I can do with his brother. One size fits all. Parenting doesn't get it. And how many siblings you have? Uh, I have a, a brother and a sister. Got it. Yeah. One size fits all. Parenting doesn't get it. You know, so he was able to, I'll give you a case. Let me tell you one quick thing. This happened to me. I was writing a book on it called Free Thinker about my dad and my mm -hmm. mom. I never knew what my dad was going to say. Smart cat, man. My sister and I were in L.A. once, and he said, I want to take you guys to a bat mitzvah. We said, what's a bat mitzvah? He said, it's a you know, celebration, and it's, it's, it's part of it's a religious celebration and a coming of age thing, and I'm going to bring you. So my sister and I went, and there was these little... Beautiful Jewish kids, kind of nervous, kind of nerdy, and you know, standing around, no one dancing. And me and my sister can dance. Yeah, we get we look like the Jackson Five at the time. <laughs> I had a big old afro, she had a big red afro. So we turned the music up, talked to the DJ, and we we got out of the floor. We tore it up. And my dad was watching. And after we was dancing for a while, he said, Come here, I want to talk to you. 
We thought, what's he going to say, you know? He said, um, I love y'all, you know, uh, but I'm very disappointed because you two are beautiful and you know you're beautiful and you know you can dance, but you're not bringing out the beauty in the other people. There's two things we love about people, Mario and Megan. We love who they are and we love who we are with them. You'll never know what that man who had been to Auschwitz was thinking or that little Jewish girl is thinking because the way you're dancing is so intimidating that they're going to just watch you and applaud you, but you're not bringing out what they applaud in themselves. Mm -hmm. So you guys are going to miss out. And I'm disappointed. So he, <laughs> did, did, did he want y'all to bring them to the brother, dance floor? We went back out. Let me tell you, we went back out. My sister got the old man up. I got the girl up. We got everybody up. And the guy wound up funding my movie years later. The kid who's bought mitzvah. Wow. You got to bring out the beauty in others. See that? that you see what I'm saying? See, and my dad understood good allies come in all colors. They don't just look like you or vote like you. Don't well, leave love it, on the it, table. It, it, it. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you, but you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. My friend, brother Lamel McMorris, mm. uh, he, he does his annual awards program at Essex. Mm. Essex excuse me, mm. at, during Congressional Black Caucus Foundation uh, annual, annual legislative conference. And so he always has a major entertainment perform. So 2019, 2019. <laughs> so mm. I'll, I always go by, I go to the deal. Mm. So in fact, hold up, let me see, I got to it's, it's so funny you tell that story because, dude, I'm telling you, I straight up uh, laugh. Because he texts, he sends me a text. He's like, bro, um, he said, help me. Hold on, let me find it. It was too, it was too funny. Cause, cause he knows I, I, you know, I love music. I love to dance and I'm gonna do it all day. Um, he, uh, here it is. Uh, he goes, uh, help. First I said, get, get here as fast as you can, I went there. He goes, grab someone and go to the dance floor. Help. Oh, uh, yes, yes. I said, you want me to get this going? He said, please. Right. I went, 90 seconds later. So here we are at the party. We're penguins, baby. And I said, we're penguins, man. Now, you know, I'm a, I can start a party. You yeah, up? yeah. So I walk yeah. out there, so it's Congressman Terry Sewell, Congress, the late Congressman John Lewis, because. It was Alabama Power. So I, so I walk out there. I was like, Congresswoman Sue, come on. She's like, no, no, no. I said, all right, try to hear all that. Come on. Shut up. Get on out of here. I grabbed Lewis. Oh, y'all, come on. I start grabbing people. And so we about that dance, so it was about 10, 15 people. Right. Then I go, hey, hey, what are y'all doing? Right. We ain't sitting around here looking. Right. Within 90 seconds, there's like 100 people on the dance floor. Right. And then others started flooding. Right. Neil was performing, and Neil, and when he finished the song, he was like, I wrote, appreciate that. <laughs> and get the party started. Right. But it's just, but it's, right. because for me, it's like, why are we sitting around watching somebody dance? Right. Yo, right, right, get up. Right, right, right. If your legs work, use them. Right, 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 right. And if somebody don't know how to do a dance, teach them how to do the electric slide right. or the right. Cupid Shuffle right. or whatever it is. But don't just sit around and observe. Right. That's interesting, my, when I remember because you started this by asking about my dad. Uh, Portier, Sidney Portier, presented my father with a Lifetime Achievement Award. And so you hear Portier, and then Melvin Bay Peebles comes up. And my dad took the words, thank you, brother. He said, put the music on. We just go and dance. And him and Portier started dancing. He said, we've done enough. We've talked enough. We've interviewed enough. We have earned it. Let's dance. In fact, all of y'all get up and dance with us. And that was it. <laughs> that was it. He but, like, I ain't giving a speech. No, no, that was it. I think, I think, I think remembering, and that's part of the joy of it is remembering to have fun. Now, there's, but, but that, that sounds 
you know, California-ish. But if you understand it. I'm from Houston. Brother, if you understand it, I, I tell you what, I had a, I saw this cat once who was a PA, just a little PA. And we had the scene with a soccer movie. I don't play soccer, so, but they really wanted me to be in this movie. And so I said, okay, the, my top half can, can run down the field. You, you pick out some legs. So I went, out, <laughs> I went out and saw all these soccer players. I saw a dude with, you know, some legs that looked like my color. I said, he'll work. So I, they, they cut to his legs and me, you know, looking like I'm playing soccer. And, but they had to fill up the stands. This was a low budget flick. They had to fill up the stands with people every day. It was in New York. So they would bring people out, take an ad in the paper saying, you know, come out and be in a movie. Now, around midday, everybody would split. Right. And the guy would say, well, gee, they're, they're just leaving because it's hot, you know, they're just leaving. He's a nice PA. And eventually he said, well, I've got to go now, Mario. I've got to go work on a different film. He left. They brought a brother in. Brother was, brother used to break the ice at a comedy store. There you right? go. They, this brother came in, they sent a new group of people out. He said, come out here, take a picture. You want a picture, I'll give you. You give me $5, I'll get you in the movie. He joked with them, laughed with them. People came and stayed all day. Wow. Personalities can cost you money or save you money. <laughs> we don't just deal with lights or cameras. Or right. We deal with people. And that's why you're so great to do this, is we can just go and flow with you. Well, when they say, hey, Roland's doing it, I'm like, oh, cool, we're good. And you people, I love, I love it when, I, when, I, when I, I hit folks up because, uh, one, there's no formal <laughs> process, not like, well, we're going to send this letter out. It was all text messages like, yo, I'm coming to town. We got Here an Airbnb. Is. Here we're is. doing interviews. Mm -hmm. And no one asked, no one said, well, so uh, is, there any, uh, is there any topic we're covering? Is there right. anything? With it? And I go, no. Or then what, what get, here's what gets me. I'll have folks, this always happens to folks here in Hollywood, they go, well, you know, I, I had nothing to promote. And I said, I didn't ask you to promote anything. Mm -hmm. I, said, for, I said, a conversation isn't dependent upon you need to promote something. Mm -hmm. I was like, it's a conversation. And I think that that's, and, I, and I'm always trying to explain to people, no, you don't have to. Well, that's a long game. You're playing a longer Come game. And we, we're, we're, we're taught to think transactionally about everything, including ourselves. And what you've got to do is also understand that your, your worth, your conversation, your wisdom, your sharing, may be something that's beyond transactional and beyond this latest movie or that latest movie. There you go. And then when you're playing the long game with those interviews, what you're doing, that's why you're doing longer interviews, is that... Uh, you're going to get a whole different vibe. And I think that that's valid. Once we get to the talking points of whatever that movie is, it's a, you know, we want to do, hit, hit these points. Precisely. Then you're going to get a very canned interview, you know. You've, and it's interesting, we've had numerous conversations and we've talked about your dad. What did your mom do? My mother, okay. And she's part of my script too, free thinker. My mom is really an interesting chick. Um, like we've she, never talked yeah, about your mom. Oh yeah, yeah. So my it's mom always your dad. Yeah, yeah. My mom. My, and, my, and I get it. I yeah, get it. No. And, and my here's the thing. One thing about the Van Peebles family. I always joke we're like the Jacksons without the talent. <laughs> 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 but we still mean, you know. Uh, so um, my we don't. You know, my eldest daughter Maya. I always tease Maya. She has a voice like Whitney Houston. She's got this mm. beautiful vo singing voice in her head. <laughs> but to the rest of us, girl sound like a dying cat. Now, early on in her life, she started singing. I said, oh, goodness. <laughs> it's a good thing she's smart. <laughs> so, but, but now she's working and doing all this pro bono work. You know, uh, did, she did campaign finance. She's a smart chick. Mm -hmm. We don't confuse in our family people we love with people who are good at what they think they love. Mm. Right? My mother loves to act. The chick can't act a lick. I would never hire her. Someone got to be Latoya, right? <laughs> you know. So, so, so my mom's not. You in said that. somebody got to be Latoya. I know you said that in there. <laughs> but so, so, so uh, we just keep it real like that. You right. know, my my dad can act if he's playing something close to Melvin. Right. You know what I mean? So I I don't look at my kids and go, oh, I, they're so cute. No, what can you really do? You know, you got to be realistic. And what do you have the energy to really do? 
Um, my mom was a photographer, a writer, and a big, big pro-environmentalist. And she's the one that- That's where you get all that yes, from. Yes, my mother, very pro-environment. Um, both my mom and dad, super frugal, very forward thinking. My mother, check this out. My, my mother's mother- What's your mama's name? Maria Marks. Got it, okay. okay. My mother's mother uh, got a cross burnt on her lawn from the KKK mm. in Virginia. Uh, because that family side of the family is white. And they and my mother's mother sued the school system in Virginia saying my children are not getting a full education. My little white girls and boys because they're not going to school with black kids, Hispanic kids, Asian kids, Jewish kids. Wow. So she sued the board as a white woman. The KKK burnt a cross on her yard, called her up and said, we hope your daughter's married niggas. And she said, thank you, we do too. <laughs> <laughs> so my family is out the box like right. that. Now the good thing for, for me, what's been dope is, one, both my father and mother, free thinkers, not materialistic, travel they ass off. So I was born in Mexico City. How many brothers do you know named Mario? For real, right? <laughs> How does that happen? <laughs> you know, this is way before Super Mario. Yeah. So I was born in Mexico City. Uh, then my parents, my dad tried to make it in Hollywood, couldn't get a job as a director. My mom said, well, why don't we go to Europe? And they went over there to be with the original colonizers, and he learned French. But we lived in Copenhagen, Denmark. And I slept in the kitchen. My sister slept in the bathtub. I mean, we just traveled everywhere. And we, you know, so I had a really interesting childhood in that I grew up seeing Rembrandts. I grew up hearing uh, Fela Kuti. I grew up hearing... Marley, I grew up going to Black Panther meetings with my dad and going to Altamont with my mom, the ultimate hippie chick. So uh, both sides were important. And what happened was it taught me that I, had, I got good people adapters. Because half of my family looks Aryan race, half of us is, is black folks. Do you know what I mean? I'm obviously a brother. Uh, but I had to early on love everybody. I got a gay aunt, I got an aunt who's a Trumper. You know, you got, you got everybody in your family. So it, it has helped me to. I think be be uh, be more diverse in my own language, if you will. experiences and we joke about this all the time oh black folks don't do that when the reality is when you think about the African diaspora when you think about even African Americans it, it's not about what you think we don't do it's really what you don't know that we've done so when folks oh black folks don't go about this vineyard well that's what they do sure do uh, Black folks, Inkwell, bro. Black folks don't um, surf. Do, My son do, do, does go, surf, or yeah. or I get it. I don't. Time. <laughs> I get it all the time. And then you know, black folks don't golf. I'm like, the golf tee was invented by a black person. What are you talking about? And how vital exposure is. And, and I think for uh, for a lot of our children, not being able to experience things outside of their circle, 
I believe it's detrimental. My parents took us to museums, and and again, parents ne- never didn't have college degrees and didn't. Mm-hmm. didn't Absolutely. Didn't also, yeah. But but they said no no no, they, and and they they purposely took us out to restaurants, mm-hmm. so we knew how to right. how to eat and how to be in public. All of those different things, um, and so th- th- there there's something to say about if you say well we don't do that as an adult. No, no, you get out of your comfort zone because that actually helps your children. Well, it was interesting when I, you know, I grew up with, you know, seeing movies like Herb Jeffries' movies and Bronze Buckaroo and Black Cowboys. So when I, I did my first feature in New Jack City, they said, what do you want to do next? And I said, I want to do a Western. You know, the first 44 settlers of Los Angeles, 26 were African-American. It makes sense. We want to get out of the South. The, even the name Cowboys, right? They called us boys, no matter how old we were. So it was, we had the dirty job. Take care of the horses, boy. Take care of the cowboy. It wasn't until they glorified the word cowboy that they then changed the representation and you didn't see us anymore. So when I, after New Jack City, I, I did Posse. And my father was right there with me. You know what I mean? So I think having an understanding of all that we can be and all that we have been and not just saying, look, we know if, you know, Hollywood's going to make... Uh, professional boxers look like uh, Stallone. But we know there's Holly and Mike Tyson, you know what I mean? And Jack Johnson and the Brown Bomber, you know what I mean? So it, we know that the karate was a martial art invented by the Asian, but the karate kid don't get to be Asian. You feel me? So once you understand that the dominant culture will insert itself in a dominant way and reduce your culture to a backdrop, mm-hmm. you understand that you go, oh man, images matter. That's this shirt here, right here. Images matter. So that's all my movies and my dad's movies <laughs> together. <laughs> to say, that's right, our images matter. Because exactly what you're saying, Roland, we want to be the success we see. So my boys grew up going, yo, we can be in the West. You know, we can be a superhero. We can be a lawyer. We can be that. And then what was a mind blower, though, was my daughters. They didn't have anyone to look at. And that was so cool about having daughters was it really hit me. I might have missed that and said, oh, wow, I got to make sure I do stuff where we see the sisters and that we encourage our sisters to make films mm-hmm. as well because they need to see themselves represented not just in front of the camera but behind the camera. So, you know, I just, I did the salt and pepper movie. You know, I, 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 tr- I made an effort to say, okay, this next Western that I'm going to do, I got some badass women in the saddle. There was Stagecoach Mary. There was some real black women in the West who didn't take no shit <laughs> you know, that we need to see. So I think, I think it's, we want to be the success we see. That's why I loved in Black Panther. The, n- not my movie, but Black Pan, you know, right, Black Panther, the other movie. They had the little little nerd science chick. Right. Who was cool as heck. Right. But knew everything about, she there was the science go. geek. I was like, that is important to see. Because some we got to make smart the new gangster. Right. You're a smart brother. That's why you're here. You know what I mean? They're going to be cats that are more talented than us, smarter than us, but they didn't have the opportunity. Right. And we have the opportunity. And we have to show ourselves that we can make that smart as a new gangster. That's Speaking it. of movies, hmm. why is it so hard to see Panther? What Bruh. the deal? Wow. I mean, if you go to Amazon, I think I tried, Man. so I have a collection of of That's of, a hard movie. They charge you $300 DVD. on Amazon. I was like, I'm not about to pay no $400 for yeah. a VHS cop. Right. What's the deal? Man, it is, it is interesting, Roland. It is the movie they don't want you to see. It's funny, I made New Jack City, you can get it anywhere. Posse, you can see it anywhere. But, but a movie that says that it is not an accident that we medicated the black communities right around the time when they were getting militant, when you had the Panthers starting to organize and people starting to vote and march on Washington. We, we let these communities get med- medicated. In fact, that comes up in The Godfather, you know, where they say, as long as it stays in the mm-hmm. black communities. So, so we asked the question, they tried to say, ask us questions. I asked them, the, the reporters when we did, I said, listen, why is it a 13-year-old boy in the hood can find a, a way to buy a gun, some liquor, or church, or some crack, and yet you can't find them to arrest those people? You can't arrest that dealer. Why is that? It's like right now. So I'm, I'm literally looking on can't get it. Uh, Amazon right now. Yeah, it's hard to get and it. And I type I t- in. You know what? I think it's free. Listen, it's free on YouTube. I don't care if I don't make a it, dollar of it. It is. Go see, see Panther on YouTube. That, th- just, just see it. That's what you need to do. I, I mean, because again, I have this collection of uh, black movies, DVDs, right. uh, documentaries, right. and I was sitting here going, 
I what in the heck? And that question has come up a lot. And they and, don't want you to see that. And uh, who, like, what studio did that? What, what, who did Panther? It, it was uh, Polygram, which then got sold to MGM. So MG, so is, is MGM, under MGM. Yeah, man. Oh, so that's uh, Mark Burnett. Uh, uh, MGM didn't, didn't MGM just got sold to somebody? You know, you know they, they go back and forth. Amazon back. or somebody like but, that. But it's that like, is, I, I'm telling you, it, it is, I, it, you can. Is it Amazon? It's, it's, it's crazy. MGM, it's crazy. Um, yes, Amazon now owns it. Yeah. But it is crazy. You cannot get that. You movie. cannot get that. And in fact, listen, when Panther came out, you know, so my father wrote it and I directed it. And we had an agreement. If people liked the movie, I would credit my directing. He would credit his writing. If they didn't like the movie, I would blame his writing. He'd blame my directing. <laughs> and we would, we'd go full in. I called my daddy the, the, the has-been that never was. He called me the wannabe that never will. And we, <laughs> we would just clown each other. But we, we did this movie, and when it came out, there was a well-funded right-wing organization that, said, that took out ads on Times Square, that whole thing that goes around, right. said, don't see Panther, the two-hour lie. And a whole bunch of folks got pissed off from our community who said, how dare you uh, cultural tourists uh -huh. come up in here and, and tell black folks what we should see and know about our own history, about the Black Panther Party for self-defense. And they took out a big ad, and it was, I think it was Spike and uh, Whoopi, and everybody got together and took out a big ad defending the movie, man. But that was the movie, man. After it came out, we got all, got all these reviews, awards. They, that, that movie has been buried. Buried big time. Big time. Big time. Yeah, it's the one movie I did that you can't see. Uh, so, Very hard to get. I, so we probably go on raise that issue. I think it's a good, I think it's time, man. Yeah. I think it's time. Right. A couple people come to me and said, man, that movie was ahead of time. And again, it's Angela Bassett playing, reprising her role as, as, uh, as Betty Shabazz in it. And uh, Kadeem Hardison. Kadeem Hardison it, right? is in yep. it. Uh, Courtney Vance is in it. That's where he met his wife. Mm. Um, Marcus Chong is in it. Dick Gregory mm. is in it with Melvin Van Peebles together. Uh, man. It was, it was what a dope experience. So you, you're very much about movies that actually say something. Mm -hmm. um, so, so folks who watch it, I, 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 get, I get this text. Roland, I got this movie. Man, it's called, you, you'll be great in it. <laughs> so I was like, OK, all right. Well, you, I want you to be a barber. <laughs> The hell, I'm gonna be a barber. And so I had one requirement. I said, Mario, I said, I got to play a clean barber. Yes, sir. I said, the brother who cut my hair growing up, his name was Harvey. Harvey was always clean. Had that ascot? Har no, he didn't have ascots, but Harvey was always dressed. That's when they had the boots that zip up. Right. Oh, yeah. Always polished. Yes. Harvey's yes. fro was perfect. Yeah. He had a real raspy voice. Yeah, yeah. He had a real yeah. raspy voice. Yeah. And he always, cologne and everything. He used to go to all of the Sugar Ray Leonard fights, Hagler fights. It was always, because it was always like, yo, shop closing early on Friday because he was flying to Vegas for the fight. Right, right, right. So I said, if I'm gonna play a barber, I said, I got to play a clean one. I said, so I got to have cuff links and an ascot. Yeah. <laughs> and you did it. You came in and you came and did it. And here's the thing. You showed up on time. You got in there. You got it done. You understood time is money and we made it happen. But the thing is, for us, for our community, the barber has often been where the, where the Greek chorus takes place, where you have those conversations with us, about us, that we don't typically get to have. So it's kind of being in the town square. And you were great at leading it off, man. Because I needed, I needed someone that could kick the truth and yet speak truth to power, but make it fun. Well, first of all, it, it, it was crazy because you had Earthquake who was next to me, right. uh, DC Young Fly. I mean, and it was funny you talking about time because uh, I had Paul a Rodriguez, speech. Paul, Paul Rodriguez, right. too. Paul, Rick, Paul Rodriguez, I had a speech to give. And Paul kept missing his lines. And I was like, Paul, <laughs> dog, come on, man. <laughs> Right. Like I got, and, and, and it, it was it was crazy because again, my show's live. So like my crew will tell you, right, you got to bounce. When I sit down, right, I am not. No, no, you sitting here like, oh hey, we need fifteen more minutes. It's like, yeah. it's about sixty no, seconds. Brother, you know when you're, I start. You're, you're the James Brown of reporting. Hey, you bro. know how James <laughs> didn't play. <laughs> you find you. You know, you the James Brown of. of no, we we were shooting that movie. I was. Look, 
Right. How far? I, I was literally on my GPS going, okay, the airport is 42 right. minutes away. Right. We got I'm it in, there. man. I'm like, we get this here. We get and it then, in. I'm, I'm seeing the sun set, and I was like, right. all right. But it, but it, but it was, because, and again, people don't, who, who don't, who, they just see a movie, they think, oh, I only have two hours. It's shooting the same thing, multiple angles. And I was sitting here, and I was like, we got to do this seven more times. But, but again, I'm just so used to live where, but boom. The, so the movie was called Armed, and there were little subtleties that you did that the, when I show the movie Armed, people crack up. I, we, shot at the, uh, we showed it at the uh, New Jersey Film Festival, and that little part where you said, oh, I got a cake in the oven or something, you see, you, you, broke, you broke it up. When, 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 when Chief starts to lose his stuff, and, you know, uh, those, little, those little subtleties were so good because you were, as I said, able to speak truth to power, but to make it fun, to package it in a way that we can hear the truth, nod our head listening, and, uh, and get it done. And, and but you did that, and, and still kick the truth. Well, it was, it was did. fun. I mean, we was, said stuff in that movie that you know, you're not supposed to say. It, it, was, it, was, yeah. it, was, it was fun, but I was sitting there going, I said, man, I don't know how y'all do this. I, I said, this is 14, 16 hours. Right. I can, because again, I'm, for me, it's like, I love live. I hate, I, I hate taped. It's like when we go, go. We going straight through. Right. And so the, the whole movie making process, again, people never see how the sausage is being made. Right. Uh, they'll, watch it, they'll watch a movie, but they don't, they don't watch the director's cut or they, or they don't watch the director's commentary. Right. Uh, sometimes I'll watch a movie and I'll, I'll watch the director's commentary because I want to hear right. how, how to describe this scene and what they did here and how they shot this and stuff along those lines because it really does give you a, a much, to me, a much better understanding of, of how it all came together. Right, well, and I, it's interesting. I, my, uh, my dad was at a film festival, I think about him a lot, because he, like, he just turned 89. Um, and they, they said, Mr. Van Peebles, what do your movies have in common? Is was there a common thread that you have in your film? And he got up there, took his cigar out, and he said, yeah, niggas win. <laughs> <laughs> niggas win. And, and, you know, and I think, about, I think about it is that, you know, for a long time, we, we thought we were, we were told we were, what, 300 years of slavery, 100, another 100 years of Jim Crow. That's 300 plus another 100, maybe 400 years of niggas don't win. We're three-fifths of a human being. And... Uh, I think us having imagery where we could stand tall and see it has been a big part of us winning. I think that uh, when South Africa fell, you know two favorite shows they were watching, Roland? They were watching Miami Vice with a white leading man and a black leading man and the Cosby Show. And I'm not talking about the Cosby Show or the man. The, I'm talking about the show as a yeah, phenomenon. Yeah, Cosby Show, yeah. And, and, and apartheid fell. That, that those boys and girls in Iowa who may never see a black person could conceive of Huxtables in the White House and call them Obamas 20 years later when they grew up. That sure. we could now, so, so what, we, what we say about ourselves, and here's the thing, in most media, and this is, this is the tricky thing, and I'm all for everybody doing what they wanna do, but in, in a lot of media, uh, we see black folks represented as stars and thugs. Mm -hmm. By and large, stars and thugs. Stars you fear, stars you envy, and thugs you fear. And neither of those is a good basis on which to build a friendship or a conversation and say, I'd vote for that guy, I'd, I'd marry her, I'd marry him, I'd get involved with them. You know what I mean? So I think that what I try to do as a filmmaker is, first of all, do things I love. Mm -hmm. I, my three loves, love what I do, love and enjoy the folks that I do it with, and love what I say with my work. But if I get those three chakras to line up career-wise, I'm rich no matter what the paycheck. So sometimes I want to do a film like Armed, I'll go out and fund it myself. I don't wait, just like you. You get your camera equipment, you call me up, you do the interview, bam. Because you shot a lot of that in your house. Totally. Uh, I don't mess you, around. I mean, you, look, you, you call folks like, hey. I, you see my daughter's there, I have my family yep, at work. Yep. Let me tell you, there was a scene in Armed where, you know, I, at a certain point my character, sh Chief, shaves his head. And there was a scene where we couldn't figure out the board the way we shot it, that there was going to be one scene left where I was bald headed, but I needed to have hair like in the beginning of the movie. So I didn't, you know, I said, okay, I need the hair lady to go get me a real good wig because I hate jive looking wigs. Right. 
So they went out and got this wig. It looked so whack, man. It just looked hella whack. So I looked around. I said, who's got the same hair quality as me? And I saw my daughters. I said, baby girls, you love your daddy? They're like, yeah. I said, I need a little hair donation. <laughs> we literally cut off. They, they donated hair. I got the hair, and we glued it on my head, and the makeup lady got it right. I got the perfect fro, man. And it was like, <laughs> literally, they gave the hair off their heads. You, you know? like, um... So, Come here, let me holler at you. Yeah, 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 totally. So, so you know, part of, it, part of it is, you know, them seeing how the sausage is made, is seeing right. the work ethic of it, understanding that whether you're in film or yep. not, you're going to have to be one, fun to work with, super informed on the craft, uh, work, come early or leave later, you know, do not be the family weak link. I don't care if you're just doing catering. Do not be the weak link. Right. Do you know what I mean? So uh, that was the thing is that my, some of my kids are in the business, some are not. Some of, you know, will be third generation, uh, and, but they will all know how to work. And hopefully they will all be pleasant to work with. And if not, let me know. I'll kick some ass. Pull up a chair. Take your seat. The Black Tape. With me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, We'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. The thing that people don't, I believe, really understand is that, and I've said this for years, like literally my, enti my entire career, mm. media is the second most powerful force in the world mm -hmm. behind the military. Mm -hmm. I always say when there's a coup anywhere in the world, the first thing they get control of are the guns. The second is the media. Media is always second. Yeah. Yeah. So for people who, who say, well, this is no big deal, it doesn't matter. I said, no, 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 no. I mm, said, totally. I said because... Look at, at D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation. There brother. you go. There you go. Look at that, man. Look at the movie Peace, Propaganda, and the Promised Land. If you haven't seen that one, check that one out. That's another heavy one that's hard to get. The yeah. woman who, um, her name escapes me, she was the German director uh, who, uh, who Hitler used. Um, mm. Why is it escaping me? Because she shot the 1936 Berlin Olympic Games. Um, <laughs> and, and really, and her rest of her career was marred by her association with, with the Nazis. But again, they, they understood her talent as this director, as this amazing director. And that's why I tell people who go on television, who do commentating, I said, don't play with this. You don't understand the power of that medium and what you're saying and who you're reaching, don't, don't, don't play with this. Oh, when you, when you, we watched the, the, uh, the, the uprising, the, the January 6th insurrection stuff, initially they were being reported as protesters. You know? My dad has a great cartoon on his wall. It's, um, it's a picture of a, of a black couple trying to get, stopping at a grocery store, there's a flood and they're taking some stuff out. And it says, you know, black family looting. And then they have a white couple doing the same thing. And it says, people gathering provisions. Now, both descriptions could be accurate. Right. But one positions something one way, another Which is based is upon who is telling the story. Based upon and, who is telling and, the and story. And it's funny so you, is it going to be his story or is it going to be our story? It's funny you brought that up because yeah. that weekend, the, the weekend after George Floyd's death, mm -hmm. we're watching the coverage. And you're absolutely right. Protesters became looters, became, pro, or, or uh, demonstrators, all different names they use. Mm -hmm. So it was Saturday. So I, so I sent an email. What about the terrorist fist bump on Fox News? Oh, all of that. <laughs> all of that. So I sent an email out mm -hmm. to all these other black media people. I said, why are we watching mainstream media define these protests? It was one o'clock in the morning, late Saturday night, early Sunday morning. I sent an email out. I said, I have a studio. My crew is on standby. We as a black owned media 
should join together and do our own coverage and not let them control the narrative. I sent out this, this BT, TV One, Essence, Black Enterprise, I sent all these people. Three responded. Um, Rich Dennis at Essence responded. Um, Revolt responded, but they did it, but just, just said, acknowledged it. But I said, do y'all understand what this moment is? So we went live that night. I didn't wait. We went live. We did about 400,000 views that night, and I think it w went over a million or whatever. But my whole point was, I don't care if it doesn't do 5 million. We cannot allow the voice of this weekend to be determined solely by ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, MSNBC, and Fox. What, you, what you're saying, Roland, is interesting because they say the news is a first draft of history. It is. It is. You're there on the ground. You're, you're laying it out. And that was the thing that, so what was, what was, what was bothering me mm -hmm. was, y'all, yes, we don't have a network like CNN and Fox. But the reality is that camera can connect to YouTube and we can broadcast. Mm -hmm. Why are we watching them mm -hmm. as opposed to us talk? So, I, dude, I, we booked probably 20, 25 guests that night. Mm -hmm. And our whole deal is black people mm -hmm. are going to be discussing the aftermath of the death of George Floyd, talking to black people on this platform with a black host that I own. And the, and the thing for me was the folks who didn't respond, and I'm sitting here going, don't you understand? Mm -hmm. This is why we have this. Mm -hmm. You have been entrusted with this. How are you not using it? Mm -hmm. And you're sitting here going, well, we, well, ah, we just can't, I said, I'm, I said, I'm taking all your excuses away. I have the studio, I have the staff. All you gotta do is simply say, we'll add it to our Facebook page. Mm -hmm. That's all I was telling them to do. Mm -hmm. But that, Mara, I think is, is the difference when you understand the power of the medium and you say, you abide by the nation's first black newspaper, Freedom's Journal, which wrote on March 16th, 1827, we wish to plead our own cause too long have others spoken for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, that's a part of you. We talked about the movie Panther was part of what was significant for them was to, for them to see black folks doing it. It wasn't going to be the, uh, the old weapons they had. It was the food and breakfast programs and the, and the free schools. Um, so... And that's dangerous, you know. It's not. It's when you, when Dr. King stayed at the the pulpit. You know, that's not threatening. When Brother Malcolm stays in the temple, that's not so threatening. But when you go beyond that, mm -hmm. tell your own story and link up with other folks, you know, and, and march on Washington and talking about economics and ownership. You come back from Mecca and say, I prayed next to Muslims of all color. I no longer see it as a color issue. I think it's a spirit issue. And, and I'm going to take our problems not, as a, not, not as, a, as a domestic thing, but onto the civil rights. Of, then you become at, at the world On the world stage. It's when you think that way. It's when Melvin Van Peebles says, OK, I made my little movie Watermelon Man. It was a comedy. Cool. But now I'm going to make a film called Sweetback. I'm going to fund it myself. I'm going to have a multiracial crew. I'm going to own it. And you make a movie and say, I've got a new band called Earth, Wind, and Fire in this movie. And you make the movie that becomes the top grossing independent hit. You never got another job offer after that. And I said, Daddy, why? You could make a movie, that, Sweetback, that made $15 million when it was a dollar a ticket. That'd be like me and you going off and making a movie that makes $150 million today at $10 a ticket. I said, why wouldn't you get another job offer? He said, son, if you go into a pool hall, and everyone counts on the fact that you can't play pool. And you play along with it. It is scratch and fumble. And then you whoop ass to take all the money. You can't go in the same pool hall again. The pool hall is called Hollywood. Mm -hmm. They don't like that. So you have, to be, you have to understand that sometimes that means, Roland, and I know you know this already, that you have to be 
bold enough to do it on your own. Not everyone's gonna be cut from that cloth. That's what a revolutionary is. You see what I'm saying? So that's it. You gotta be, that's the Van Peebles family. You know, yes, I'll, I'll go off and make this film for the studio or that one, but I will also go off and say, I'm gonna make Panther, or I'm gonna make Armed, or I'm gonna make my own, a film that I wanna see get made about us for us. And, I, and I'm not afraid to do it. And listen, it's it not just we, with black folks. I mean, if you make a film that goes up against the system, you can't take money from the system. If you take money from the system, then you got to you got to say the same dialogue that the system's right. saying, right? So I can't make supersize me and take McDonald's money, <laughs> right? I can't make Panther and take the man's money the same way. Understand? So, so as an independent filmmaker, as an independent journalist, mm -hmm. there's a different road. With oh, absolutely. It. You know, so you, we, we go in knowing that. It's time to be smart. Roland Martin's doing this every day. Oh, no punches! Thank you, Roland Martin, for always giving voice to the issues. Look for Roland Martin in the whirlwind, to quote Marcus Garvey again. The video looks phenomenal, so I'm really excited to see it on my big screen. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. See, there's a difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. I gotta defer to the brilliance of Dr. Carr and to the brilliance of the Black Star Network. I am rolling with Roland all the way. Honored to be on a show that you own, a Black man. <laughs> Owns the show. Folks, Black Star Network is here. I'm real um, revolutionary right now. Like, wow. Roland was amazing on that. Stay black. I love y'all. I can't commend you enough about this platform that you've created for us to be able to share who we are, what we're doing in the world, and the impact that we're having. Let's be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You can't be black on media and be scared. You dig? What would you love to do that you haven't done? That, that it, it is, you're like, I, I want to do that. I want to, I want to. Yeah, okay. Is, is it a movie? Is it a, is it a, is it a documentary? Is it a, what is it where you like? Okay, so that's a good. I want to do that. Yeah, yeah. So that's a really good question. That's part of what I, what I love about this business. It's the surprise at the bottom of the Cracker Jack box. I didn't know that. I would get to play Malcolm X and Ali with Will Smith. And that my daughters would get to play Malcolm's daughters. That I would get to work with Malcolm's daughter to humanize her dad. And that my father had interviewed Malcolm X when he was in France and my dad was a journalist. That was a surprise at the bottom of the Cracker Jack box. I often don't know. When they brought New Jack City to me, I wanted to make it, I said, oh, okay. It's a, it's a, it kind of read like a black Scarface. I wanted to make sure that it read more like a multi-culti untouchables because I knew that crack is a killer in our community today, so I couldn't just have a, uh, the, the wholesale glorification of the crack dealer. So if you wanted kids to say no in our community, you had to have role models to say yes to. Mm. So against, you know, Judd Nelson and Chris Rock and myself and, you know, uh, Ice T, of course, you had role models. Yep. Yes, sir. So I didn't know that I would do that. I didn't know you'd call me for this interview. So part of what I love is that I don't know. Now, there are other things that I'm a fan of. I want to do my, my, the story of my parents, free thinker. I'd love to do something on Egypt. I'm, I've always been interested in the pharaohs. Um, I'm interested in the true Africa, the West Africa. I've got a lot of West African mm. blood. Do you know what I mean? When I did, when you met me doing Roots, part of the fun of that was not doing slavery was doing empowered people mm -hmm. and, and showing that part. That was, that was something that I've been interested in. But every day, brother, I'm exposed to things and I go, uh, I get excited about things that I never thought of. Um, I was recently asked to act in something that I may do about one of the early civil rights uh, workers, Harry T. Moore and his wife, um, Harriet Moore, who were the Bonnie and Clyde of civil rights and social justice way before you know, other folks got on board and they were uh, true to it, not new to it. 
Um, so I find things every day, brother, and that's the cool thing. And you know what? Now that my kids are big and they don't need me the same way, you know, mm -hmm. I'm more of a manager versus, you know, I, I, you know I'm more of a consultant, less mm -hmm. of a manager in mm -hmm. terms of the parenting of it all. Uh, I can do what I want because I can, I can take different risks now. And I'm, you know, I'm not a materialistic cat. So part of what I love, brother, is that I don't always know where I'm going to end up next. I just did the Wu-Tang Clan series. Mm -hmm. So I was the producer director on that, got to work with RZA. And then I did uh, the Raising Canaan, which is a spinoff of Power. Yep. Um, so I, I, I'll, I'll work this technology, work that, learn something over here, and get in where I fit in. Sometimes I'm just directing. Sometimes I'm just acting. Sometimes I'm writing. Sometimes I'm doing all of the above. Playing my father. I didn't really know that I would wind up doing that. Playing my father in Badass was a great experience, man. So. See, I think you, you used the word just a moment ago when you said excitement. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the thing that, um, that I try to convey to people. Um, it's not a job. It's not a career. It, it's still the excitement of the craft. You, you take a singer. You take a singer who is not caught up in will it hit the top five on billboard but they still enjoy the craft they still enjoy uh grabbing that camera and looking through that viewfinder or they still enjoy writing and, and that's the thing that i i try to convey to people they they, they say man I, I watch you and hey you you were you were carrying the tripod and, and you were shooting and i go yeah because there still is the joy of, man, I love that shot. Hmm. Or, oh, look at the use of the LED lights on the color in the background. And, the, and oh, man, that, because I, I, that's why I try to explain to people when you know you're truly doing what you want, when that, that just, just, just getting that shot that drone shot or that Gia, that, that still brings you joy. Mm -hmm. that's, un, that's loving the craft. <laughs> yeah, yes, it is. And, and to me, it also goes, it reverberates, it echoes. I'll give you a case in point. It was a brother that stopped me and my dad. We were walking down the street. He had long silver dreads and he had his son with him. And he said, Van Peebles, excuse me. And we both turned around. And he said, I have to tell you both that I'm a, a fan, I'm not a groupie, but I'm a fan. And sometimes I go to the films and I'm entertained. That's a good thing. Sometimes I go to movies and I learn something, and that's a good thing. And sometimes, rarely, I come out of a movie proud to be a black man. And with your movies, I get all three. Mm. The echoes. Right. When people say, when you see, there's a big difference, Roland, between being recognized and being appreciated. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Kim Kardashians are recognized, appreciated. That's a whole different thing, man. Last question for you. Hmm. When we think about where we're going, what do you, there are a ton of people doing content. There are people, everybody name I want to be doing content, producing and you got podcasts and all, I mean, everybody wants to be doing <laughs> What do you tell them about the responsibility that they have and how they use it? Well, see, that's a, that's a tricky one, Ro, because I realize that the only one that can take that advice is myself. So I'm, I... You know, I, there are a lot of films that I see get made that I go, why would you do that? When we finally have the keys to the kingdom, when we have the means to production, why would we say that about ourselves? You know what I mean? I, I, was, I remember once I was in Italy, I went into a nightclub, and it was all Italian folks, cool, and uh, I was from some film festival or something, and the DJ looked over at me, and he's, he did, hey, you know, one of those things, and I said, oh, shit, here we go. And he put on some 
rap thing about bitches and hoes and shooting niggas. And they all start singing along. And it makes you wonder, you go, man, why, why do we want to say that about ourselves, man? You know, it's like, Paul Robeson asked a beautiful question where he says, if we buy into the values, the, uh, the, the, the zeitgeist of those who would buy and sell us as a people, what have we become? Mm -hmm. And so I would say, be very careful to, to not just buy into stuff and That's say, right. the, the, they said, the colonizer said this. Here's the thing. We know racism, for me, racism is next door to sexism. If you repress over color, you're going to repress over sex. If you repress over sex, you're going to repress over class. If you repress over class, one day you're going to be destroying Mother Nature herself. It's all related. That bully colonizer mentality is, is death to the planet, man. Mm -hmm. And as, as black folks, we have to really stop and say, wait a minute. Wait a minute, this gave them cancer, but our, our, our folks knew how to use baking soda as deodorant and not put aluminum under your arms. We, we, had the, we had that ancient wisdom, we original people. We know how to do this, do you know what I mean? We had those remedies, do you know what I mean? We had those healing abilities. So I would say, try not to just buy into wholesale into the colonizer's point of view of mm. success. Success mm -hmm. is that you can call me and we can talk amongst folks that look like us, mm -hmm. for us, by us, if other people want to leave. I didn't have to leave any of me on the, at the doorstep. Right. No one's telling me what to say or not say. That's success. That's free speech. Right. You feel me? That's success to me. Now, I'd rather be that than some cat that's locked up, can't do this, can't say that. Hell, success to me is a film. All I can do is put on one pair of pants at a time. So I don't need 100 Different right. clothes. You right. what so success to me is the creative freedom to do and say what I want to say. And so I would say to the young brothers and sisters coming up is that examine your message. Examine what you think your ideas are. Mm. And, and before you pick up that microphone, make sure you got something to say. And if you don't, then shut up. And if you do, let us hear it. Make sure you got something to say. Have something to say, man. We'll leave it there. <laughs> My man, I appreciate it. Yes, brother. Thanks a so bunch. Yes, man. Man, you look so pretty, all yellow. Just chilling. You know, <laughs> chilling. I knew you were gonna come with a fly hat, so you know I, I, you know I had to make sure you know we we, we were straight with it. <laughs> look good, brother. Appreciate it, man. Of course. Thanks a lot. Yes, sir.